Coming up in this week in computer hardware, VR standard initiative sounds ominous, but should be awesome. Intel 270 chipsets and Cobby Lake desktop performance benchmarks, magnetic fans, Samsung wins, and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 392, recorded December 8th, 2016. Copy like desktop surprise. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Grasshopper. Stay connected and run your business from your mobile phone with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, visit trygrasshopper.com slash twitch. Welcome to Twitch, This Week in Computer Hardware, Twitch Weekly Show. The aim is to bring you the most useful, most informative, most engaging, most delightful, and apparently fastest information on PC hardware, mobile hardware, consoles, and occasionally even a watch or an Internet of Things device. Matter of fact, we have a lot of Internet of Things, but not today. Because, ladies and gentlemen, today we have the man, the myth, the legend himself, storage benchmarking guru, Alan Malventano, joins us. How's it going, sir? I'm all right, man. I understand yeah. there are 12 terabyte SSDs floating around in the universe. No, no, no. Hard are drive. about to. What's that? Hard drive. Spinning rust. Oh. Yeah. Just, just when you think they're gone, man. <laughs> no, no. They refuse to die. Is it an affordable 12 terabyte hard drive? <laughs> uh, I mean, I couldn't keep the, a straight face you know, saying that. We'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, I think, if we all have right. that in the notes. Do we have that in the notes? I think. I believe we have that in the notes. If no, not, we'll we can get it fix in there. that. Yeah, we'll, so we'll find it. So we do have in the notes. Uh, Kronos Group is announcing a VR standard initiative, um, which is important uh, if you like VR gaming or if you think VR gaming is the future and you don't end up with a gigantic, endless battle of which device, uh, you know, supports which game. That they're going to leave down to the traditional, you know, whether Oculus or... HTC, you know, Vive cuts the biggest check, haha. Ha. But uh, Epic Games, Google, Oculus VR, Razer, Valve, AMD, ARM, Intel, NVIDIA, Vera, Silicon, Sensix, and Toby are all together uh, with a VR initiative. Uh, just basically to produce an API that can be targeted by drivers from each vendor, right, Scott and the show, so that applications can write once and target all compatible devices. This makes me and that's happy. A, that's a good thing. That needs to happen, definitely. Because, um, you know, VR ecosystem is kind of segmented right now, like anything else that's a brand new thing <laughs> in the computer industry, right? Yeah. Um, you know, HD DVD, Blu-ray, like, imagine if there was just a common API and the thing just worked either way. It didn't matter what you had. Um, yeah. So, yeah, they need to do that for VR, especially since there's all sorts of different, you know, methods of doing the compositing and all sorts of different sets of hardware, you know, it just needs to work together because at the end of the day, it's just like a head-mounted display and some controllers, really, right? Really, um, there's not. It you shouldn't know, be that complicated. It shouldn't be that uh -huh. complicated to to <laughs> kind of puzzle that stuff together. Like that's why I'm always so puzzled. Like, uh, you know, I know there's some kind of exclusivity deals going on still between like uh, with stuff coming out for the Rift, stuff coming out for the Vive, but. Like when it comes time where it's not exclusive anymore and it takes the company a long time to like port something that was for the Rift over to the Vive, like it doesn't make any sense to me because it's just like, look, yeah. you just, you plug a controller into the PC, you just, you're just putting a different head mounted display on. Like there's not a whole lot different. You know, part uh, of me wants to put on my comic book guy voice right now and be like, well, apparently you don't understand the initial difficulties of, you know what I mean? Like where it's just, <laughs> I, you know what I mean? It's always, everything looks simple or th it should be simple. But I think the reason that, that this group is coming together uh, is because it's never as simple as it should be. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting. Uh, Microsoft not on the list uh, for the VR standards initiative. Um, well, they're kind of know. doing their own AR thing, not so much VR. So, well, well, they also, but they also just announced the specs for their new, uh, the windows VR goggles, um, yeah, which is shockingly low, but they, you know, they've, you know, the windows 10 VR, you know, which has been announced and is going to come out eventually. Um, you know, but they basically said, uh, you know, core i5 dual core with hyper threading, uh, integrated Intel HD graphics, 620, eight gigabytes of Ram, um, you know, 
pretty low. Uh, but Microsoft is definitely moving towards VR um, that is coming. So it would be nice to have Microsoft on board along with, you know, pretty much everybody else, you know, Steam VR, Oculus, Gear VR, OS VR, Daydream. Um, you know, the it seems like everybody's there but Microsoft. And uh, Scott also notes that Mozilla is not on there for web VR, but uh, we will find out. Qualcomm also, Scott notes, is not on the list. So yep. it would be interesting to see whether or not they join. Or maybe this is sort of a, you know, this seems to be sort of an effort for the Kronos group to be like, come on, everybody. It's time. It's time to get real about VR or it's going to be like 3D on televisions. But worse. Yeah. Um, well, and I think the, I think most of the Steam VR stuff is all already open source. So... Uh, yes. That means that, you know, all the stuff that carries over from the HTC Vive, I would imagine uh, Kronos Group would probably just latch on to that stuff first because, like, you know, you're not getting some company dragging their feet. Oh, well, we're not sure we want to give you our whole thing. Or, you know, Steam's just like, here, here's all the stuff. Like, do the thing. <laughs> do the thing. Make yeah. this wonderful, people. Yep. Speaking of wonderful, Intel 270 Express and H270 Express chipsets, uh, Support Cabby Lake, more PCI Express 3.0 lane, as uh, Tim wrote this up for PC Per. Basically, the details on the next generation chipsets are emerging slowly but surely. Um, you know, it's yep. basically going to be like, uh, well, you know, basically, I mean, this, you know, the support you there's, want. There's not a whole, there's not a whole lot of difference, actually. Right. Um, the the big thing is that the chipset itself has uh, four more PCI Express lanes. Uh, compared to you know the whichever letter 170 right. version, right? That's a um, that's a big deal to me um, because yeah, um, I'm finding like I'm in USB 3.0 port hell because of a lack of of PCI Express lanes on one machine. But exactly, and something like this would allow a motherboard maker to add in like an extra you know USB 3 port or two, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, or maybe even four, depending on if they want to kind of bottleneck it based on those PCI lanes versus the the throughput of the PCI Express or the, the USB port itself. Um, so it just, you know, it just gives the computer makers a little bit more flexibility. Uh, motherboard makers are integrators making laptops that the mobile version of this is going to go into. Um, you know, it just gives you some more lanes. And But remember, these lanes are behind the chipset. So the chipset is bottlenecked by uh, DMI3, which is basically PCI Express uh, 3.0 by 4. So there's only four lanes of PCI Express going to the CPU effectively as far mm -hmm. as all the communication from all of the things, uh, you know, behind the chipset. So that includes, uh, and usually the thing that is the bottleneck um, for like RAID configurations is the, the SATA ports, right? Because that's the thing that does a lot of just bulk sequential throughput if you're trying to move a bunch of stuff around. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, the actual bottleneck works out to about 1.8 gig per second. So it's still pretty quick. But if you throw, you know, if you had a motherboard with a couple of M.2 slots on there designed to be rated uh, and you had a couple of NVMe SSDs, I mean, just one of those SSDs can hit that speed now. Um, right. So start running into, you know, potential issues there if you want to go crazy with a, with a really, really fast raid. It's just not going to happen when you have to go <laughs> through the chipset as far as as far as sequentials. You'll still see improvements in random access. You'll still see, you know, IOPS and all that other stuff will still be good. Um you know, chances are, aside from storage, all that other stuff, it's just like a way to fan out and get more PCI Express. So like, you know, it's like um, it's like a power strip, right? <laughs> like you got you got all these extra little things you want to plug in, all these little chargers and dongles and whatever, you know, wall warts, things you just need to plug in, and you just need more ports, right? Uh, right. You know, not necessarily uh, drawing a lot of power, but you just need, you know. A lot of little, a lot of little things that are sipping power, right? So you just get, you know, a big old power strip. That's effectively what the chipset is, in, in terms of like fanning out PCI lanes. Ten sixty four eighty RX four eighty from uh, AMD. The ten sixty on uh, coming from NVIDIA GTX. Um, man, two fifteen, two ten, two thirty, two fifty. You know, 220 to <laughs> You're just throwing numbers. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, it's, it, you know, it's funny, right? Because everything was so expensive this summer. And now you're looking at like a GTX 1060, um, you know, a six gig version of that card selling for like $250, a three gigabyte for $210. Um, 
you yeah. know, over at the RX 480, uh, eight gigabytes version are selling for about $260, uh, you know, and actually four gigabyte versions are selling for like 240, 220. Uh, here's one for looks like as low as 210. I bring that up because Hardware Canucks uh, did something they don't do very often, which is take a look at a competing uh, uh, price bracket. In this case, that's kind of $250, $300 price bracket. And take a look at the benchmarks again. And they did this for the uh, GTX 1060 and the RX 480 and essentially updated their review. And what they found, uh, I, won't, I won't reveal everything because they want hardwarecanooks.com to get the traffic. Um, but what they found is one of those cards improved dramatically between July 2016 and December 2016s. And one of those cards essentially stayed, uh, uh, you know, did not improve. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't know how else to say it, but it was, uh, it was surprising. Um, and the, you know, the, the difference in performance between, uh, uh, direct X 11 and direct X 12, um, was I thought also kind of fascinating to um, you know DX12. Uh, I don't think it's been very friendly to to to, to GPU driver uh, firmware driver writers. Uh, that's all I'll yeah. say about that. Um, AMD hardware in general tends to uh, like age better, mm -hmm. right? Like they they optimize. It's as if when they it's it's as if the hardware kind of leads the driver and the software side way more on the AMD side. Like and so. The downside is when the hardware is brand new, you kind of have to deal with some, in in some cases, like the performance is like really bad for some titles and you just have to wait for them to kind of optimize for those things. But once they do get all those optimizations, optimizations done, you're getting, you know, effectively more performance out of that same piece of hardware. Um, mm -hmm. It just, I kind of, I kind of wish sometimes they would have done all that right at the beginning, but like time is a limited resource and they only have so many, uh, you know, personnel to throw it at a hardware and software release. So uh, Nvidia has more people to throw with that stuff, so naturally, like their driver stuff tends to be just done right at the beginning, mm -hmm. and they tend to not see that many improvements uh, as time goes on. Mainly because there's just not anything else to to squeak out of it, um, you know, to get out <laughs> of that hardware. Um, which is also fine. It's just you know that's just how the one company works versus the other company as far as driver development goes. Yeah, let's uh, let's hope they improve quickly. Uh, actually, I should say that I'm I'm thinking ahead to uh, the GeForce 376.19 driver story, because um, while you're saying like Nvidia tends to come out of the gate and 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 not get performance boosts in the hardware, they're they're con both companies are constantly tuning the drivers to improve performance on individual games. Um, yep, but and sometimes they break the, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you, you noticed, yeah. yeah. So GeForce 376.19 uh, drivers. Uh, uh, came out, uh, that's to support the Oculus touch controllers from Oculus VR and like 50 something games that came out with it. Um, this does not, however, resolve the problem, uh, people have had with folding at home, which is unfortunate. Uh, but the, uh, quote, one of two SLI issues in no man's sky, uh, has been repaired. Um, uh, so that's, uh, uh, that's unfortunate, uh, but the, unfold, the folding at home bug is not yet fixed, right, Scott? But it's now classified as a top priority bug. So yeah, we'll see. And they're pretty gets... quick on they're pretty quick on the turnaround on the yeah. on these sorts of things. Yeah. Oh my goodness! Uh, big news this week. Uh, not a whole lot to say. Uh, Supreme Court basically said, you know, uh, Samsung, you didn't copy that much. You're good. This, this, then they, they overturned the, the gigantic judgment. Although, huh. you know, yeah, yeah. Basically, Samsung does not have to pay the $399 million uh, penalty that the appeals I mean, court laid down. I don't know exactly which things they were using as far as like proof of this or that or whatnot. I don't know any of the like intricate details of this thing. All I know is that there was a period of time there where you'd see a Samsung product like all the way down to its charger. Mm -hmm. well, like looked basically like a carbon copy of the, you know, the same Apple product. So I mean, I maybe, maybe that far. there were a couple there where it was pretty darn close. Like the little charging brick was like the exact same size and shape as like the Apple one. And it was like, fortunately that, that only happened, I think for like one generation of products. And then they seem to have quickly kind of moved away from that. So maybe that's what saved them here. You know, I'm glad they didn't stick yeah. with it because it just seemed kind of silly for them to both be like that similar. 
uh, even for one generation, you know, it's just kind of like, well, what are you guys doing? Like, make your own stuff. <laughs> but yeah, they, I mean, they're nothing just like them now. Like the hardware, it. you know, it's yeah. all it's all vastly different now, um, which is good. Well, you know, well, if you're looking at you know what originally started out as nearly a billion, potentially a billion dollar settlement, and then has slowly been cut down, uh, I think you might tell your design and engineering teams to diverge <laughs> from the from the lawsuit you may be losing uh, immediately or imminently. Uh, Pebble is dead. Um, if you were uh, a Pebble enthusiast, um, you know, basically uh, the uh, Pebble's, uh, Pebble's uh, engineering team, intellectual property, uh, has been sold to Fitbit um, and the testers. Uh, and pretty much everybody else is being let go. They're selling out Pebble stock uh, on store shelves or in the, and uh, yeah, you know, there's no, basically there's no Pebble support is going to be available anymore. Uh, and any Pebble quote uh, out in the wild is no longer covered by eligible or eligible for warranty exchange. Uh, it's the word that was passed along to Gizmodo. Um, so basically, um, you know, if you bought a pebble last week, you better hope it doesn't huh. die, uh, because there are no replacements or repairs. Uh, now and is, is, did they, did they have to run some kind of, like if you were using a pebble with an iOS device, did they have to run something on their back end in order for like the notifications to work like through, through iOS? You know what I mean? Uh, I think it's, I think it's primary the, uh. I think it's I think it's the app that runs on the. Uh... Okay, I just didn't know if like if companies that did like say push notifications, I didn't know if each company that had like a specific app kind of had to have like a centralized server or something that was like mm -hmm. talking to Apple uh, for that kind of thing. So if there was, then I you know at some point obviously that would go away too, uh, potentially. So just something you know? to, something to possibly think of as like a consideration for. When they finally do, if there was a server, they finally shut it down, then like notifications might just stop working. My understanding was basically just an application that communicated between the, the phone and the watch. But I'll be honest okay. with you, you know, I've purchased one. Uh, I've purchased one smartwatch for testing and I still haven't really found a compelling reason to keep wearing it. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Uh, when yeah, Ryan and Ryan and Ken had a pebble that bounced back and forth between the both of them, I believe, and I don't think either one of them kept it on for very long. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, this is you know, I think it was Christina Warren wrote in Gizmodo back in October that no one is buying smartwatches anymore, um, you know, and that smartwatch shipments are down fifty one percent year over year. Um, that's uh, you know, Apple's shipments are way down. Uh, on the Apple yeah. Watch, so yeah, my wife, my wife offered to get me one for Christmas, and I was just kind of like, eh, like don't don't waste your money, kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> like don't spend a lot of money on something that will be obsolete within a year or two. That's a watch. Yeah. Like you know, I have a watch that I bought myself over twenty years ago. It still works <laughs> just fine. It's got a sapphire face, just like some of the Apple stuff. And yeah. it hasn't scratched, you know. Yeah, it's it's yeah. I'm, I'm looking at the uh, the Pebble app uh, reviews on the iTunes Store. Oh dear, that probably doesn't look very good. Uh, you know, is it like two stars? <laughs> average? You know, nobody's actually talking. I don't think anybody's absorbed the fact that Pebble's been bought. It's more like update ruins the Pebble experience. Not sure if bug fixes are going forward or backwards. App hangs as normal. No change with new updates. Um, <laughs> ouch. You know, it's it's down to two stars from a previous rating of two and a half stars. So uh, remember, kids, software that works is important if you want your hardware to succeed. Hard OCP yeah. got their paws on an early Cobby Lake. Um. I guess it just kind of showed up from sources unspecified. Yeah, I think uh, a lot of vendors just kind of like leaked a bunch of CPUs to random people because these are not from yeah. Intel. Yeah, well, we talked um, we talked last week about 
the the exciting improvements in performance for Kobe Lake uh, laptops. Um, Kobe Lake desktops, at least on the benchmarks uh, that the hard OCP, cre- uh, hard OCP crew were running, looks like pretty much, um, man, you know, just this, you know, if, if, you know, the Kobe Lake Core i7 seven. 100k when compared to the Skylake Core i7 6700k at the same clock speed um, is pretty flat. Um, yeah, you know, but it, it you know Kobe Lake should overclock better. Um, yeah, those of us that are expecting a better performing CPU in terms of IPC are going to be disappointed. For the CPU enthusiast that has little or no need for iGPU, Intel's Kobe Lake is likely to be the snooze fest of the year. Hopefully we will see five gigahertz overclocking within uh, wake the new copy lake up a bit. If anything, this is just peaked by excitement a bit more for AMD's upcoming Zen processor. Kyle, I mean, we knew we knew this was going to be feelings close to the chest as always. Uh, yes, always. <laughs> um, but we we knew this was going to be the second talk, right? Like it's not tick tock now. Intel and Intel was upfront about this. Not like it was a secret or anything like that. They said a while ago now. They're like, look, we're gonna do, uh, you know, it's gonna be more like a waltz. You know, it's you know, three three uh, sets of three for our release uh, cadence. Um, and, and this is supposed to be the optimized one. And you know, I mean, they're just they're obviously optimizing some stuff. <laughs> um, but, but don't, ex- but don't expect, you know, I, I think the optimized what they're going for is really like more power consumption kind of stuff and getting the same performance out of the CPU for less power. Um, you know, I which is also you. good. Yeah. There's nothing but, wrong with that. You know, just a, just a little bump, just, just a little something. Yeah. That'd be nice. Yeah. I mean, that would be nice. Just realize it's, it's pretty drastic. Like if it was just to get just a little bump, like you're, you're retaping. You know, like, you, you know, you're you're redoing stuff in the CPU even for a little bump, right? Uh, which Fine. is the tick. It's not, you know, it's the tick in the talk, not the third, not the third one. But uh, just be rational. Be yeah, your yeah. rational, thoughtful, intelligent self. Yeah, I'm hoping, I I'm hoping when they finally do that next, I'm <laughs> hoping when they do that next tick, the DMI thing we talked about earlier from the chipset, mm-hmm. I'm hoping they're going to increase that bandwidth so that way we're that not worried nice. about that. You know that bottleneck anymore, but they couldn't do that in this one because, again, it's not a tick or a talk. Well, they don't do ticks sense. or talks anymore. They're just dropping new processors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did you hear we, them? They we, said no ticks and talks. We secretly <laughs> replaced the name of the old one with the new one. Here's the new processor. Yeah. Oh my goodness! This episode of this Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Grasshopper. Grasshopper is a virtual phone system designed for entrepreneurs. Grasshopper works just like a traditional phone system, but requires no hardware purchase or software installation. With their iOS and Android app, callers can reach you wherever you are on your mobile phone. Grasshopper allows you to keep your existing number so you can maintain your brand. It's nice. When you make a call, your client will see your Grasshopper caller ID instead of your personal phone number. Just select a toll-free or local number, record a custom greeting, add multiple extensions for your business, you are good to go. Toll-free numbers are great for marketing and make your business sound more professional. Nothing says I'm big like a toll-free number, even if you're actually just a couple of people in Northern California. Set up department and employee extensions with custom call forwarding to any phone in the world. Get voicemails emailed to you as audio attachments. You can send and receive SMS text messages from your business number. Join people, people, people. Join the over 250,000 Grasshopper customers today. Plans start at just $12 a month, and you have a 30-day money-back guarantee to improve the way you look to your customers, to make your life simpler, managing the whole phone situation. Turn your smartphone into a business line with Grasshopper. To save $50 on your order, go to trygrasshopper.com slash twit. That's trygrasshopper.com slash twit. And we want to thank Grasshopper for their support of this week in computer hardware. And twit. Exciting. I do not miss VoIP systems. I'm just going to say that right out loud. (laughs) So in your previous career, I don't know if we've ever mentioned uh, uh, your previous, previous career, the one involving being underwater. Yeah, uh, the submarine thing. The submarine thing. Did we ever uh-huh. discuss 
you know, some of the crazy, like, did you have magnetic bearings or magnetic fans on the submarine? Or was that considered too, I like, crazy? Uh, I was on one of the submarines that uh, had a, they tried to uh, maglev, which is just the thing you, the term for, like, magnetic levita levitation of a thing that's rotating. And the idea is you don't want noise to travel to something else, you know, and you don't want less friction and all that stuff. It's handy. Um, they tried doing that with one of the... Uh, Turbine, steam turbine generators, which are the things that uh, generate electricity for the submarine. And there's a couple of them, but like these things are big. It's a huge piece of metal and it's rotating pretty quickly. It's like, you know, taking like a Volkswagen and like spinning it at like 3,600 RPM or something like that. Right. Uh, that's a lot of mass to, have, to be spinning that that's fast. That's a lot of stuff to be spinning that fast. Yeah. Um, and, you know, they had, so, it was a little bit buggy. And the system would occasionally just like let let, the, let that spinning Volkswagen land on what was called like crash bearings. And like then they had to open it up and inspect them. And it was like delaying submarines going out to sea. So finally, they were just like, nope, let's get rid of those things. And, uh, you know, just in time for me to get to that submarine. So, of course, it was not delayed anymore ever. And I always <laughs> was going out on time and never had any extra time at home. Anyway. Aww. Yeah, the, 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 yeah. So there's uh some things that's easier to do magnetic levitation with, and that's like a really lightweight little fan, like for a PC. <laughs> um, you know, and it doesn't need to be like an electronically controlled magnetic levitation thing. It's probably honestly just like a science experiment level kind of thing where you just like suspend a magnet between two other magnets. Um, it seems which simple is, enough. It's something you can do, right? It's it's you apply the same thing to a radial like kind of kind of bearing there, um, right? Inside of a fan, and uh, you know you can you can quiet down the fan. Now, I mean, it's not going to be, it's not like there's a, this night and day difference because you you don't really hear sleeve bearings. The things you hear if you have a fan going bad is like chances are it's a ball bearing fan, mm -hmm. and chances are the oil has just all you know evaporated off because those those things aren't really sealed very well because again it's just a silly you know just simple little pc fan doesn't need to be like super awesomely sealed and you know industrial grade stuff so eventually you know the the oil kind of evaporates off and then the thing starts making noise um you have like sleeve bearings which are usually just like a you know very slick uh sleeve like a solid piece of metal um right. and uh those tend to like hold their oil a little bit better first of all, because mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to seal them as well. And uh, there's nothing rolling over something else, right? It's just a, it's just metal sliding over other metal with, uh, with oil in between the two. Um, so those, you really don't hear sleeve bearings and they really right. you know, like, don't, don't tend to fail, like that kind of thing. Um, but these would take it like one step further. These, you don't have to worry about lubricant evaporating off. You don't have to worry about any of that stuff. There's just magnets just holding the fan steady in the center where it's supposed to be and uh mm -hmm. ideally you know no no parts rubbing on other parts right it's just a it's just a thing that would be nice. yeah um and that's what these are um uh they they do note in the article they're a little bit more expensive obviously because uh you know it's probably right. a little bit more a little bit more like quality control involves it's i don't think it's so much because they're so hard to make i think it's because like once you've made them they probably have to do a little more qc uh, mm -hmm. Just to make sure that they they are actually spinning properly and that the assembly went together the right way, because this is not something that tends to be like mass produced. Right. You know, they're just doing like so it sounds like they're just starting this up. Um, you I know, computer industry's done this. It's happened on and off, right? Like we've heard of these right. bearings and fans in the past. It's just it tends to be like a company does one short short run of them or something, and then they just decide to move back to the cheaper sleeve bearings or even ball bearings if they wanted to go. You know. Uh, yeah. I was yeah think? I was when you when you get <laughs> magnets <laughs> when you go to Corsair's uh, webpage of the ML series um, you know they've they do a maximum performance minimal noise and instead of telling you what the uh, dB levels coming from the fan was they do comparative performances at 36 uh, uh, dBA so a weighted decibel measurements and they've got like 400 rpm to 2400 rpm and they said uh, their top competitor is around a little under 600 to a little over 2100 rpm which is most of the range of this and then a standard pc fan will get you from 900 to 1800 hertz while staying uh, uh at 36 db um 
It was interesting. And they also pointed out that their static pressure, i.e. the amount of air being shoved by the fan, is is you know, can, you know, higher than their, their, their sort of best competitor and, and a, significantly nearly twice as high as, as on a, uh, on a cheap, uh, PC fan. So 76 cubic feet per minute, uh, compared to 55 for a cheap fan or 67 for a close competitor. I don't know if you'll, you'll hear their performance. I would love to see if anybody gets, you know, one of these in an anechoic chamber and figures out, uh, how low they can go sound wise. Cause I personally yeah. think most of the noise we hear from fans is from air moving in the blades in the enclosure yep. uh, and not yeah, from that's totally uh, the case, not from actual, you know, back in the day, lots of bearing noise, but I don't think I've had a bearing noise issue from a fan that wasn't dying uh, in years. So, yeah. Yeah. And they usually tend to be the really cheap fans. Like I, I wouldn't imagine any, you know, modern day, like decent quality case fan, you know, those things should run for a decade. You know, the LEDs might burn out on them, but usually the fan continues to work just fine. Especially if they're blue LEDs. Those things don't like running for more than a couple of years. Especially when I'm watching them. Except for the ones like on the, the cheap Lapai uh, amplifiers, um, which oh, seem to yeah. last forever and you can read yeah. by them from several yards away. Yeah, they blind you when you're trying to be in a dimly lit room. Yeah. <laughs> Hate that. Throw a special TMX review budget FFB for Xbox One and PC. Josh wrote this up for PC Per. Did Josh talk about this on the podcast last night? Yeah, his, yeah, he did. His uh, quest, his pedal quest. <laughs> well, you know, he started with one or two reviews there, and it seems like uh, every company on the planet that makes a racing wheel um, decided that they were going to flood him with products to review. Um, so the idea here is low cost, right? This is not like one of the much higher, like the Fanatic ones or other wheels that he's reviewed in the past this is just your typical budget you just want to do a thing with a racing wheel and you're not looking for the you know the premium experience necessarily um so i think it's only like a 900 degree wheel um it's compatible pc uh let's see was it is this one xbox and p and playstation i'm trying to think oh no it's xbox one and pc um but, you know, they, they replace a lot of the things that are typically metal in the higher end racing wheels. They just shift everything down to plastics, right? Right. Um, so there's a couple metal bits in there, but it's mostly plastic enclosure and like the bracket that holds it to the table is like, you know, a plastic thing. Uh, the If you go down to like the last picture on the second page, you can tell there's like a, instead of metal supporting the backs of the pedals, there's just kind of like this mesh honeycomb style plastic injection molded thing you know it's still rigid but it's much more lightweight feels a lot less like an actual car uh you know when you're trying to when you're trying to you know be in a simulation and driving and whatnot but mm -hmm. you know at the end of the day it's a budget you know budget-minded racing wheel with pedals for 200 bucks right? right so not not a bad deal not at all yeah good to know verge has a google wi-fi review pretty simple Quote, solid Wi-Fi coverage, easy setup, powerful app, but expensive, not as fast as other mesh systems, and lacks a USB port for network storage. Um, I just thought I'd throw that in there. People have been curious about the Google Wi-Fi and its relationship uh, to the previous uh, Google uh, uh, <laughs> networking, pro pro networking uh, products. And, you know, I had a question about, like, you know, is OnHub going to go away? I'm like, who knows? It's Google. You I mean, know, the idea here the Google is Google Fiber was going to go away. What is the idea uh, here? This is just a router replacement. Is that yeah, essentially. I mean, you know, okay. it's 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 competing with Eero, Amplify, uh, several other products on the market that are basically uh, trying to use multiple boxes in your house to uh, better distribute Wi-Fi coverage. Um, okay. You know. Um, I mean, it looks it looks kind of like the shape might be an, an inhibiting factor on like doesn't have external antennas, you know, and it looks like it's only well, two by two internally. Almost all of these, I mean, you know, there's there's arguments about whether or not you can get, you know, whether or not you need external antennas or where they can do fancy things uh, involving, yeah. you know, multiple internal antennas. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, all of these devices have in common that they're trying to be as aesthetically appealing or as aesthetically you know, unobtrusive as possible so that people will actually put them in places other than closets or, you know, buried behind lead boxes. Um, yeah. yeah that's and they're, the, and they're the selling order. them in like 
I think the idea is to be able to, if you have a larger home, to kind of pepper these things around your home, yeah. not just have just the one, yeah. right? Um, so yeah, instead of I mean, one the, big one, you just have smaller ones kind of like distributed. They even have like a three pack for 300 well, bucks. The big one on the, they're all, they're all sold and, you know, uh, they're all sold in at least two and usually three packs. The one that was on the left in the picture that was up on the screen a second ago, the, the, the Orbi, that is actually using a dedicated, uh, 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 basically has a dedicated radio to backhaul. Uh, internet okay. between the Orbeez and, uh, you know, the, it's, it's, it's probably something I will need to write out in a thousand word essay before I kind of completely sort it all. But there's basically, you know, there's some that are mesh and there's some that are more like a router with dedicated, uh, extenders in the sense that if you get more than one extender away from the router, you precipitously drop speed, which is not a true, uh, mesh network, but that's a, yeah. that's a whole nother I, conversation for, for a lot of people. The biggest advantage is they will be able to move anywhere in the house. Yep. And they will have network coverage, and they will not have to switch between, you know, different uh, wireless access points. So the roaming yeah, if you're, ability there. If you're a power user type, you kind of want to look for where, uh, like the thing you were just saying, where your backhaul is like on a separate channel. It's not sharing right. time with, you know, if, if, you're, if your radios are all connected to each other the same way that you're connecting to the router, to the mesh network, then that means that you have to share time with that device talking to whichever the main one is in your house. Um, you know, yeah. being able to have a separate independent radio, separate channels, two things can actually talk at the same time. That That's where you don't see a, a noticeable uh, reduction in your in your throughput. Which would be nice. So. Yeah, that's the way to go if you can do it. I thought it was pretty crazy. Uh, uh, <laughs> Lenovo says there's going to be 12 Moto mods per year. So those are the snap-on backs yeah, for yeah. the uh, Moto Z phones. Uh, so this looks like it's going to be a thing moving forward. And that sounds like they might actually try to keep that design consistent over generations, which would be extremely awesome. Um, but yeah, they, you know, they're talking about uh, Incipio, Mophi, Kate Spade, Len and Lenovo, uh, and the article Jessica Dolcourt wrote up for CNET. Um, and they count through year from April to April. So look for the number of mods to ramp up starting next spring. Right. I'm hoping they don't get cheesy. As like, you know, the breathalyzer one is interesting, but like, <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't, it, it doesn't take much to get really cheesy on this. And if you put yourself at a hard limit of, we will do this many per year, like yeah. eventually, eventually there's going to be like, you know, the spinning top mod where you like, just like, you know, you pull it off and it, you spin it on a desk or something like, you know, right. it's just, it, it could get really corny. Yeah, well, imagine. it's also, it's, it's been frustrating for a lot of people. For example, the Hasselblad um, Moto Mod, which is like, oh, I'm going to have a Hassel. This is the camera that went to the moon. By the way, shout out John Glenn, passed today. Um, mm. Just going to lay that out there. Um, the, uh, um, you know, the, the reviews in the Hasselblad have been mixed because, like, the software was messy. And it basically does zoom, but, you know, which is great because, you know, your cell phone probably doesn't zoom, not optically. Uh, but the, the image quality wasn't any better, particularly than the camera itself. Um, right. You know, that was right. a $250 back. Um, you know, other ones, yeah. have been JBL's audio back has been, you know, kind of more popularly received. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. There we go. Mod craziness, people. Yep. So. I mean, the, I just uh, feel like there are some people that are going to tinker and they're going to love this. But I feel like right. when it comes to phones, the vast majority of people are just like, yeah, I just I just want a smartphone. <laughs> I just want my phone. Um, I just want my phone to not like collapse uh, when I put it in my pocket. I want it to work. And I would like a cheaper data plan. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Uh, Western Digital HGST. Um uh, have are making some massive hard drives. Oh, uh, they're and SSDs <laughs> I don't know how else too. To so say they're it, man. Yeah, so so uh so Western Digital bought SanDisk and they've been merging with HGST for a long time. There's some uh complications there just that have been taken on a longer time with uh, you know, inter intercountry uh meshing of two companies, I guess, that there's limitations on and whatnot. But um I think they're going to kind of stick with HGST as the, the branding behind the enterprise product lines. Um, and so they're going to have, they've updated their enterprise SSDs. They're going all the way up to eight terabytes on uh, the NVMe slash PCIe style connected ones. 
as well as the SAS connected ones, which is also still used in Enterprise. Um, they have a uh, half height, half length PCI card. Uh, it's the SN260, I believe. Uh, that's going to use eight lanes of PCI Express, which is not typical for an, uh, an, even an enterprise SSD. Usually they still use PCI Express 4 or 3.0 by 4. Um, but the eight lane ver variant will do like 6.2 gig per second, which is pretty Ooh. darn good for throughput of a single uh, SSD plugged into your system. Um, and then, uh, probably more importantly for those that follow HDST, uh, those are the guys that are the responsible for the whole helium filled hard drive thing. They're the ones that kind of started that with the uh, with a six terabyte model like several years back that has now progressed all the way up to a 12 terabyte model um, with a future an future announcement of a 14 terabyte model of the same hardware that will use uh, shingled magnetic recording, which basically means you have to record things in relatively large sequential chunks as the tracks actually overlap each other slightly, which is how they're able to get, you know, the extra capacity on there, basically to squeeze the tracks together a little more. The catch is, since you're overlapping each track onto the next, it actually is like shingling roof. So, uh, you know, you kind of have to do that in one direction only. And so they kind of segment it up where it's relatively small chunks of tracks mm -hmm. that they have to shingle. But it's, so it's sort of like a tape backup with, a bunch of small tapes, relatively small tapes, right? Um, That's not breaking. Yeah, yeah. But um, so w the reason I like this is that uh, it was the HE8, the 8 terabyte model of the of the HDST Helium versions that basically right. turned into the Western Digital Red 8 terabyte, which is a Helium full hard drive, but it's the exact same chassis. It's the same hardware. It's slightly different firmware. So... Uh, the fact that these guys, this side of Western Digital is now like two jumps ahead, right? That means that pretty soon we'll probably see like a 10 terabyte Western Digital Red or, or maybe even a 12 terabyte Western Digital Red. Like, I don't know, I'm kind of guessing here, but like maybe by the end of the year, next year or something like that. Um, you know, I mean, that's good. It's good to see the hard drive capacity still continue uh, to be pushed. And, you know, because right. that's. If not, uh, if not for SSD competition, like the hard drive stuff is still a goal for the SSD stuff to reach, right? You'll, you still have people out there that are like, I I can get way cheaper cost per gigabyte out of a uh, hard drive than SSD. They don't understand that the hard drive performs like one one thousandth of the random access performance. Um, right. You know, like they're like this is an enterprise grade HE12, and if you look at the spec sheet, like the IOPS rating is like. Uh, for random read, it's 186. Not 186,000. It's, mm -hmm. it's 186. <laughs> so you have SSDs that do like 100,000 IOPS, um, just as a comparison point there, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, it's just, it's just really interesting that they're able to squeeze that many bits into, in this case, it's eight platters. That's you know, pretty so crazy. It's like, uh, so each platter is like a terabyte and a half for one small three and a half inch platter. Pretty That's interesting, pretty density. amazing. Yep, and it's not and it's not using the any heat assisted magnetic recording or any of that uh, kind of next generation stuff. stuff. This is still <laughs> this is still just uh, perpendicular magnetic recording where the the poles are just vertical on on the on the disk. So nothing wrong with that, people. No, yeah, yeah. Anything you're looking forward to at uh, CES this year? Uh, I mean, a lot of the stuff that we're seeing uh, covered in like news pieces and stuff. Now we're probably going to end up like we're, we're we're bleeding into like all that stuff we're going to potentially see on the show floor or in the back of some hotel suite somewhere, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I mean, we're at that point, right? Like we're all the stuff that right. people are talking about as as announcements. Where chances are we're going to see in in a couple of weeks and hopefully take pictures of and cover and uh, you know. I can't decide if you're a, excited or just incredibly bored by it. Well, no, it's just that I've, I've lost count of how many of them I've done. So it's it's really just kind of like the same as it ever was. Time to make the donuts, whatever you want to call it. It's just I, I go to the thing. I go I go to the different places. You know, I'm I'm excited about the new technology that's there. Right. But as far as like the, the, the you know, the 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 act of covering the thing, uh, I'm probably 
less looking forward to, as you well know, because like we're just trucking our butts around Vegas trying to go from hotel to hotel, um, true. you know, with not enough time in between meetings to get from point A to point B and with a bunch of other computer geeks basically trying to do the same thing and clogging up the whole taxi network. So, you know, yeah, um, I, I kind of wish they That's- would just like, yeah, I kind of wish there was like, a small back corner of one of the convention halls for CES that they just replaced, like they charged what they would charge for the hotel suites just to mm-hmm. get those spaces so that they were all just in like one place, like all the, all the like core PC hardware stuff. If they just like stuck it all in one place, we could just like lap that thing within like three hours and get all the information we needed and we'd be done. But you know, they have to make it more of an adventure. It's a lovely dream, Alan. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. That's that's totally a pipe dream. That's <laughs> never happened. <laughs> I like it, though. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we should see Ryan Shrout back from his travels next week on PC Pur. Mr. Alan Malventano can be found not only in Kentucky, but online at PCPur.com, bringing the truth to the, to the, to the storage the reviews. I was about the to say something thingy. else. Completely inappropriate for a family podcast. <laughs> uh, you can find me at uh, techthing.com, T E K T H I N G.com, or at avxl.com. And uh, we had a fun episode this week involving the world's finest hair dryer and DJI's Mavic Pro and more, including uh, if you're looking for an affordable 1080p desktop monitor, we got picks for you. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware. You can find all of our episodes and information on how to subscribe at twit.tv slash twitch. And look, kids, there's Ryan Trout right there. And uh, me looking kind of bald, which is how I look. Thanks, everybody. Alan, thank you so much, man. Yep. Thanks for having me. We'll see you next week on Twitch. Twitch.